A number of people have asked me how I came into this revelation of the Father's love. See, I've been walking in this. This is my 20th year now. It's almost the beginning of my 21st year. And uh, <clears throat> to give you a little background, I began to minister in uh, Youth of the Mission in 1976. My first contact, direct contact with them was 1976. My wife and I went to a leadership training school in Hawaii. And it was a time of God's, some very deep dealing in our lives and real blessing of the Lord. And after the Montreal Olympics, Lauren Cunningham asked me if I would come and share uh, with the International Leadership of YWAM about faith and finance, or the principles of faith and finance. And I have a little message called Father Faith and Finance. And basically the revelation that God had given me in that area is that there's a difference between giving and receiving and sowing and reaping. And a lot of Christians, I feel, are kind of have some struggles because they say they want to give, but they want to give with a pure motive. And, uh, and so they think that if you give expecting something in return, you're not giving with a pure motive. But there's an entirely another different principle when you talk about sowing and reaping. You sow for the purpose of reaping. And uh, so I gave a lot of illustrations from my past along that area. It had a tremendous impact upon the leadership. And uh, afterwards, they gathered together to discuss this, and they had $130,000 in a ship fund. They had been going to buy a ship down in New Zealand called the Maori, and at the last, just at the last minute, the deal fell through. And so they had $130,000 in a ship fund that was designated for a ship, so they couldn't use it for anything else. And God spoke to them to give that money to Operation Mobilization to help them purchase their second ship called the Dulos. And uh, the implications of that throughout Europe are really tremendous because here are two sister organizations that do very similar works. One is basically evangelical and fundamental coming out of Moody Bible Institute, that's OM, and the other is more charismatic Pentecostal, which is YWAM. And, uh, this is probably the largest gift, at least it was at that time, that Operation Mobilization had ever received. But the, the ramifications of that throughout all of Europe was, behold how they love one another. But they had sowed that for the purpose of reaping. That was the principle. And as a result of that, some of you know that God gave them their big ship called the Anastasis, which is ministered to hundreds of thousands of people been involved in mercy ministry. I think now they have about five different ships that are used all over the world. And uh, so the principle of sowing and reaping, you sow a ship, you reap a ship. Or you reap more than you, more than, more than you sowed. That's the principle. <clears throat> and then, we uh, invited Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth of the Mission, to come and minister to us in our ministry. We uh, celebrate, we celebrated at that time what we call the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, the same holidays as the Jews celebrate. And uh, it was the beginning of the new year for us and a uh, time of really having a real spiritual impact upon us and so on. So Lauren came to share with us and shared a burden that he had to purchase an old hotel in Hawaii. 65% of the world's population is in a 2,500 square mile radius of Singapore. And at that time, 5% of the world's missionaries were ministering to 65% of the world's population. And he had a burden to have this place where he could train and send people out into all of Asia. And so he just shared this burden with us, and, uh, and the Lord spoke to me. Now, I have to give you a little background of that also. <laughs> when I was a Bible school student, I was very impressed with the story of the widow and her mites, or her two coins. 
Remember the story. Jesus was observing the money that people were putting into the treasury. And uh, wealthy people were putting in large amounts. And here this widow woman came, and all she had was a couple of coins. And, and she put in those coins, and I think she maybe was kind of had to sneak up there to do it. She felt probably kind of embarrassed, you know. But Jesus saw it, and he turned to his disciples, and he said, She has given more than all the rest of them, for they gave out of their abundance, but she has given her very living. I was so impressed with that story that I said, God, I want to give so that you notice. <laughs> so whenever the offering, I was a Bible school student at the time, whenever the offering plate was passed, I would always put in everything I had. Um, you know, it was, it wasn't much because I'd given away the large amount, but if, what, you know, $2.50 or $10, whatever I had, I would put it in. And God began to put in my heart a desire to give. And I remember one night walking up from prayer meeting, and I just had this cry in my heart, and I said, God, if you ever gave me a million dollars, I'd give it all to you. Well, that's a pretty safe prayer to pray when you're a Bible school student living by faith. <laughs> but later the Lord led my wife and I into a real estate investment and told us there was a million dollars in it. So we've seen the value of this property go up and up and up. So when Lauren shares this burden to buy this old hotel in Hawaii, the Lord spoke to me and he said, remember what you told me that if you ever gave me a million dollars, you'd give it to me? I said, yes, Lord. He said, I want you to give that property to Iowa. And that was probably one of the most glorious meetings I've ever been in. <laughs> but we gave that property to YWAM, which actually gave them the equity base by which they're able to purchase this hotel in Hawaii, where University of the Nations is now uh, well established and developing. And thousands of people are sent out all the time into Asia. The Lord had spoken to me a while before that. A woman had given me a thousand dollars to meet a particular need. And, uh, and afterwards he spoke to me and said, just as I prepared the heart of that woman to give away a thousand dollars, I'm preparing the hearts of people to give away tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars for the work of the kingdom of God. And my wife and I were riding in the car a little while after this had happened and she turned to me and she said, Honey, when God spoke to you that he was preparing the hearts of people to give away a million dollars, did you ever think he was preparing our hearts to give away a million dollars? So we've had the privilege of giving away a million dollars. But you know, you can't outgive God. The next year I was ministering in New Zealand. That's where I first met and was really linked up with our friends here from New Zealand, Morris and Denise Jordan. And God immediately bonded us together during that time. But anyway, we were, uh, we were in New Zealand and uh, a woman came to me who had seen her father and mother and brother all die in a concentration camp before she was five years old. And I'd spoken that night about the necessity of breaking ungodly soul ties if we're really going to be free. And she felt uh, she'd been sent away to an orphanage and grew up in the orphanage uh, until she was 15 and then she was released from the orphanage. Here she is in a foreign country without any family, out any roots, no support system, and she'd gotten involved in immorality. And she came to me and said, I really feel that my immoral past is affecting my relationship with my husband and I want you to pray for me. So I prayed and broke these ungodly soul ties and then God spoke to me and said that's not all she needs but I didn't know what to do. See I'd been involved in deliverance and inner healing for many years but I didn't know anything more than that either. And then a young woman came to me who uh, was at this place for to receive some help but the staff came to me and said, you know, we can't even talk to her. She won't establish, we can't even establish eye contact with her. There's, uh, we're just not getting through to her at all. We wonder if you could help her. Well, God put a burden on my heart. And so she was working in a little canteen and I would go and, 
and uh, try to strike up a conversation with her when she wasn't busy. And so finally she opened up her heart to me and told me that she'd been sexually abused by her father during her teenage years. And finally it had gotten so bad that she couldn't handle it anymore and had told her mother what had happened. And that had resulted in their being divorced and his being put in prison for child abuse. Now she feels this terrible guilt because she had told the family secret and broken up the family. And I said, you know, I really feel, I, know, I understand that your trust has been deeply violated, but I really feel that you are hiding behind a veil of shyness. That's why you can't establish eye contact with anyone. And uh, I said, I feel that God wants to, you know, God wants to deliver you. That's a fear of intimacy that you're hiding behind. And so I prayed for her and God broke that fear. But then again, he spoke to me, he said, that's not all she needs. And I kept going through these kinds of experiences. I said, God, what are you trying to say to me? It was then that God began to show me that many, many people are emotionally crippled and handicapped because they've never received the right kind of love. God intended that we be born into loving families. And many people did not ex have that experience. They were not born into loving families. They never have experienced what it is to really ha experience the life-giving effects of human love. And so I said, God, what is the answer for these people? And the thought came to me, maybe it's in a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And so I began to search the scriptures and God began to give me some revelation about God wanting to be a father to us. And I began to share those things and it was kind of exciting, new revelation. But you know, teaching is usually communication from mind to mind. And I was talking about the deep emotional needs that people have. And the teaching was not necessarily meeting those emotional needs. And one day God spoke to me and said, it's not enough to tell them I love them. You must minister my love to them. Now that put me in a real battle. Because everything I'd been saying about the Father's love, that his love is pure, his love is liberating, his love is unconditional, undeserved, unearned, I was saying to contrast it with our human love, which is so often selfish and possessive and conditional. So I didn't really feel I had that kind of love. I mean, I could stand here and talk about how Father loves you, but see, it's another thing for me to say, here it is now, receive it. The second thing that was a problem for me because I was saying that people need to be held. They need to experience love strokes. They need to be embraced. And that was really scary for me, especially to think of ministering love to the opposite sex. You know, it's one thing to be pure if the only person you ever touch is your wife. But to think of ministering love to another woman was really, really scary for me. And so I went through a number of weeks of God's really dealing with me and breaking me. And finally I said, God, I'm willing, but I didn't know what I was going to do. As soon as I said I was willing, he began to speak to me. And he spoke to me from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I should say along about that time, I also received a letter from an intercessor friend of mine and she knew that uh, the struggle that I was going through and she'd really been praying for me. And she said, Jack, I believe that God spoke to me uh, from the story of Elijah and uh, the widow's son. Remember this little boy died and his mother took him and laid him on Elijah's bed. And when Elijah came, he stretched out himself three times on this little boy and he came alive. She says, I believe that God has spoken to me that if you are willing to embrace people, people that are emotionally dead will come alive. Well, that was a bit of encouragement to me. <clears throat> but then he spoke to me from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 7. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. 
So, having a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. See, it's very easy for us preachers to lay the word on people. Paul said, because of our fond affection for you, we were willing to impart our very lives to you. Now, I don't know you can interpret that in different ways, I'm sure. But it's really spoke to me that whatever was involved here, Paul was ministering and nurturing these people. They were really experiencing something of the affection of God through the Apostle Paul. So that brought me a little bit of release when I saw how Paul ministered. And then he also spoke to me from John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him and this came to me as a real revelation see I knew that Jesus lived in me and I knew the Holy Spirit lived in me but when you pray all your life our Father who art in heaven you kind of think he's in outer space someplace so it was a revelation for me to realize that Father lived in me and Father wanted to love people through me and so I began to step out in faith to minister his love to people and tremendous things started happening well, people said, Jack, that wasn't you holding me. That was the Father holding me. That wasn't you loving me. That was the Father loving me. And there's no way that any of us can take somebody in our arms and have some miraculous thing happen. But if we are channels for Father's love to flow through us, then the miracles are going to take place. But we're just channels. In fact, the next year, Lauren Cunningham asked me if I would tour the YWAM bases in Europe. And so we started out in England, went to Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Norway. When we were in Switzerland, God just began to move in an incredible way. And Thursday morning he spoke to me because I was crying out to God. I said, God, what is really going on here? I've never experienced anything like this. And that day the director came to me and said, Jack, in the eight years that I've been here, I've never seen God do so much. He said, I don't know how to account for it. I said, brother, the Lord spoke to me this morning. And he said, when you gave away that property worth a million dollars, I gave you a gift worth more than a million dollars. So what I've had to share with you this week is a gift that's worth more than a million dollars. There are people that are so wounded and so hurt. If they could experience the healing that God has for them, they'd pay any price for it. I don't have any money anymore, but I've got a million dollar gift that I love to give to people. 1978, he spoke to me to bring healing to the nations. I've been to 30 different nations. I've been to Korea 33 times. I've been to many other nations many other times. And I have a spiritual heritage in all these different nations because of the Father's love. I wouldn't trade it for anything. God has a gift of love that he wants to give you and he wants you then to also be released to impart to others. It's a million dollar gift, worth more than that. 